Hey everybody, welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. 27 events in our in the month of May, and we are on the home stretch now down to our last six. Let me clue you into some of the other events that are coming up for the rest of the month. Uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., there's an event called Freedom with Leah Yippie, Michael Hart, Martin Hagland, and Vanessa, Vanessa Wills. And at 3 p.m., what was neoliberalism? With Sarah Bruyette, Nikhil Pal Singh, um, Joshua Clover, and Jamie Merchant. Uh, and then on Saturday uh, at 11 a.m., we have Uno Kozo's Theory of Crisis Today with Richard Westra, Ken Kawashima, Wendy Matsumura, and Gavin Walker. And at 11 a.m. on Sunday, we have There's No Such Thing as the Economy uh, with Samuel Chambers, Cordelia Belton, Edward, and Soren Mao all the way from Sweden. Uh, and finally, on Monday, our last panel uh, put on with Spectre Journal, uh, Ukraine, Imperialism, and the World Economy with Ilya Matviv, Rebecca Carl, David McNally, and broadcasting to us from Ukraine, we hope, Yulia Yurchenko. Uh, so that's it. That's all that's left, except we do have one movie next week on Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. at the Beacom Cinema, the last of the Miklos Yanchko series, Electra, My Love. Uh, we do not have any institutional support, so we depend on the kindness of strangers. If you like what we do and want to see another Red May next year, go to our website, uh, www.redmayseattle.org. You can contribute to our Patreon, uh, or if uh, you want to give a one-time donation uh, to our GoFundMe, uh, fan, fan the flames of Red May. So two ways to give, uh, and uh, we hope you will be generous. We're like Branch Dubois. We depend on the kindness of strangers. Uh, enough of this prattle. On we go with the event. Uh, today, uh, happy to welcome back a Red May alum, uh, Cedric Johnson, who will moderate this panel on Nixon's war at home, uh, from COINTELPRO to counterterrorism. Uh, Cedric is Associate Professor of African American Studies and Political Asian, uh, Science, I almost said Political Asylum, Professor of Political Asylum. How would you like to be that, uh, uh, Cedric? That would be great. No, but it's Political Science at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's the author of Race Leaders, Black Power, and the Making of African American Politics from the University of Minnesota Press and author, author of The Neoliberal Deluge, Hurricane Katrina, Late Capitalism and the Remaking of New Orleans. Uh, Cedric, welcome back to Red May. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Um, I want to offer a quick welcome and good evening and good afternoon, depending on where you are, to our, uh, our audience. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited about this particular panel. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Philip, not just for the introduction, but also for uh, organizing Red May year after year. Uh, as he mentioned, I am, I guess at this point, a, uh, a regular when it comes to Red May. And we were just talking uh, before we went live about um, the last in-person Red May, which I had the pleasure of participating in. So it's great to even be involved in this way in the virtual sense. And I'm excited about this particular book. And I'm hoping we can have a great conversation about it, both with our panelists, but also from the audience and, and the kinds of questions that folks might offer um, after our panel. I actually think this book is really important as far as providing us with two um, connected origin stories. On the one side, it's an important contribution to thinking about um, the origin of the left as we know it, the left uh, out of the Cold War, the left after the uh, collapse of the Communist Party and um, radical trade unionism of the 1930s and, and uh, 40s. And I think it also combines not only this, this history of um, the new left, but it also brings us a history or origin story of mass incarceration. And I think in both cases, it offers a lot of um, you know uh, generative discussion. And so I'm really excited again to hear 
the kinds of things that the panelists have to offer. I'm interested in hearing what Daniel has to say about uh, his work now that it's it's out and circulating in the world, and as well, you know, the kinds of comments that we might get from the uh, the question and answer period. I also think, and I'll just say this quickly before introducing our panelists, that in light of recent events, in light of uh, not only the 2020 um, George Floyd protests, but in light of the uh, insurrection, um, you know, uh, last year at the at the Capitol building, and then you know, thinking now to the mass shootings of the last couple of weeks, there's a way in which this book lands at a particular time where we're much more heavily armed as a country than we were even during the 1960s and and 70s. It's now become not only um, uh, more common for us to witness, you know, militia in the streets. But we see that on both sides, right, on the left and the right. And so, again, I'm curious about what our panelists have to say um, about the book and the ways that it may continue to speak to our uh, our times. We're going to begin this panel uh, with comments from the author, Daniel Shard, who is a visiting professor of history uh, at Western Washington University. His writings have appeared in Jacobin, um, also in the Radical History Review, the 60s and other uh, outlets. And in addition to authoring Nixon's War at Home, he is also co-editor of Science for the People, uh, Documents from America's Movement for Radical Scientists, uh, which was published by UMass Press uh, in 2018. So welcome, Daniel. Looking forward to what you have to say here. I'm excited about this, this book. Uh, thank you so much, Cedric, for that uh, thoughtful and kind introduction and to, to Philip. And I just want to echo everything Cedric said about hello and solidarity and greetings to all our comrades on this session and watching wherever you are in the world. And well, happy Red May. It's really exciting for me to be able to be on this session with, with, with people who I really admire as scholars, as um, politically active people. And you know, my path to writing this book is it's not conventional in the academic sense. Um, I, 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 can't, I, I came to this topic as somebody who was involved in different movements in the late 90s and early 2000s. I've been involved in various aspects of the left in varying capacities since then. But during that time, I was involved in animal rights movement, environmental movement, movement to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, who is a former or Black Panther from Philly, still incarcerated, no longer on death row. But then from there, into the what we called at the time the anti-globalization movement. And then the, you know, and then from there I was doing support work for different political prisoners, including people who who um, had come out of some of the guerrilla movements, domestic guerrilla movements of the US in the 60s. And I'd visited some in prison. But then later um, I had dropped out of college my first time around. I went back to school at University of Southern Maine when I where I was living in Portland at a time when I was trying to kind of process my involvement in these movements. It was right after the Green Scare in late 2005, 2006, when a lot of a bunch of um, anarchists or former anarchists from the mostly who had been in the Pacific Northwest were rounded up by the FBI for their involvement in political arsons. And a lot of them became informants while facing like decades in prison. And I was really trying, assessing these movements. So. I ended up uh, going to being encouraged to go to graduate school. I ended up at University of Massachusetts, and um, I knew I wanted to to research some of these guerrilla movements. And um, the, a shorter version of the story is so I end up, you know, looking through FBI documents from various places, microfilm, Nixon Presidential Library, and was really interesting. And you know, of course, I read Mark Rudd's memoir too along the way. And, um, you know, a lot of the memoirs and, and literature on these guerrilla movements and, the, you know, groups like the Weather Underground and the Black Liberation Army were most prominent and they were also created a lot of the most problems for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. But um, there was over 600 bombings as a conservative estimate in the Nixon era from 1969 to 1974, especially during the first part of that and other attacks as well, um, police assassinations and you know bank robberies and stuff. Others had explained like why in the context of the Vietnam and police violence, repression of movements, racist police violence, why people took up and, and anti-colonialism, 
people have explained why people took this route of wanting to bring the war home and create a guerrilla movement in the U.S. But I, I was really interested in the question of, you know, how did this violence influence politics beyond the left in the Nixon era? How did it influence the FBI? How did it influence concerns about national security? And um, and that's led me to eventually writing this book. Through, um, and uh, what I'll do now, just kind of try to briefly go through the kind of big inter main interventions I think it makes, and then maybe we'll, we'll do some of the commentary and we can continue the conversation. But um, I'd say the, the two big interventions in the literature that I think I'm making, and I really appreciated Cedric's comments too about his perspectives. Um, one is that the preemptive surveillance and policing now known as counterterrorism has its origins before 9-11, but not just going back centuries, specific to this time and comes out of, in the US, this conflict um, between these leftist guerrilla groups and the, the state. And um, there's a few like sub arguments to that part. Um, one is that um, this, this conflict between the FBI and these guerrilla groups was part of a shift in US national security um, state priorities from anti-communism to anti-terrorism, that this conflict involved the FBI reviving surveillance tactics previously used against the communist party, like break-ins, you know, just breaking into people's house to find information, mail opening, warrantless wiretapping, that in the name of fighting terrorism, and a lot of people don't realize J. Edgar Hoover, who ran the FBI from 1924 to 1972, he and, um, you know, was behind, was involved in the first Red Scare after World War One and the second Red Scare um, after World War II. By an, in the mid 60s, he had actually banned a lot of those practices because he was concerned about leaks. I can explain more of that, but this gets revived in the name of fighting terrorism. And then the FBI invents new techniques to fight what they call terrorism, including interagency task forces, the FBI's first undercover program, um, the um, um, contingency plans for hostage situations. But another part of this argument is that counterterrorism was political. It, it and it came out of a specific political economy and it really addressed certain forms of non-state violence without addressing the root causes, which include state violence. Um, and in that sense, it's part of kind of, as Cedric mentioned, part of this punitive turn in American politics where state spending priorities are moving away from the limited social democracy of the New Deal and the Great Society towards mass incarceration, right? And of course, militarism is, is pretty much a constant in there. But it's also was limited, this counterterrorism was also limited in its effectiveness and sometimes even counterproductive with unintended consequences. And that brings me to the second big argument, which is that this conflict also led to a conflict between the Nixon administration and J. Edgar Hoover's FBI and within the FBI that played a big role in leading up to Watergate and Nixon deciding eventually to form the plumbers when he couldn't rely on on Hoover to do all of his political bidding. So there's, there's a different there's different flashpoints in this in, in both the development of this nascent counterterrorism, which really gets picked up on in the 80s, but it just developed here, and this institutional conflict. And those include um, you know, bombers on Nix in Denver who are bombing transmission towers on Nixon's inauguration day. One that Mark might be able to talk about, although I don't think he was there, but when the Weather Underground blows up a townhouse in Greenwich Village as a, where they're making bombs um, in March 1970, there's a Marin County courthouse incident with uh, Jonathan Jackson um, leads a, a, a raid to free black radicals from prison there, and it ends up in a, in a shootout and a bloodbath. The bombing in Madison, Wisconsin by young white anti-war radicals, 1970. Um, the emergence of the Black Liberation Army in New York um, in 1971, May. And then there's the Munich Olympics um, attack by the Black September Palestinian nationalists. So all of these are flashpoints in this conflict. I propose talking about COINTELPRO in the title of this talk because I think this, that resonates with a lot of people on the left. And although it's not the focus of my book, I also I talk a lot about Cohen, the counterintelligence programs and try to deal with some of the the, the myths and orthodoxies in some of our thinking that have developed around those. And I think that's something we could come back to, but I wanted to just lay out some of the big arguments of the book first, if that's okay. And um, maybe I'll stop now.
let other people talk. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, we want to continue our conversation with uh, Atiyah Hussein, who is an assistant professor um, at Carleton University in the Department of Law and Legal Studies. Uh, her work focuses on race and terrorism, and her current book manuscript excavates the epistemological, racial, and theological foundations of the FBI's most wanted program uh, from the 1950s to the present. Uh, her work has appeared in various places, uh, including the um, journals uh, Social Identities, Ethnic and Racial Studies, and also the Boston Review, among others. So uh, welcome, uh, Tia, and looking forward to what you have to say um, about the work, and I'll, I'll step aside. All right, thanks for that introduction, Cedric, and um, hello to everybody, um, and congrats to Daniel for this fascinating book finally coming out. Um, one of, it does one of several useful things that I wanna focus on today, um, and, and that's something that you mentioned in what you just said, Daniel, that the book challenges the common and easy kind of claim that 9-11 is the start of all things terrorism. And of course, this book is not the first to demonstrate that. But what I've found is that this particular insight, which is also the opening frame of the book, is sometimes acknowledged but not really taken seriously for its implications. And that goes for people across the political spectrum, including progressives and the left. So for our conversation here, what I want to contribute is a story from some of my research on FBI wanted posters and highlight some of the dimensions of that story that resonate with some of the major themes and contentions in Nixon's war at home. It's the story of when Asada Shakur was added to the FBI's most wanted terrorist list in 2013. So some, some important background there is that Asada has had a wanted poster in circulation for most years since the early 1970s. Um, she was wanted by the FBI prior to that 1973 New Jersey Turnpike shootout. And after her 1979 prison escape, there were FBI posters and New Jersey state posters that circulated to facilitate her capture. After that, there's this interesting kind of period of silence, um, at least on the representational side, um, and we see that because in 1996, the FBI got its first website and it put its wanted posters there along with its archive of um, its 10 most wanted uh, posters all the way back to 1950. And Asada was nowhere to be found on, in any of these archives until 2005. In 2005, the FBI added her to their domestic terrorism list alongside anti-war activists and mostly other mostly, you know, white and black um, American leftists. Uh, but then in 2013, they moved her to the most wanted terrorist list next to the leadership of Al-Qaeda and Al-Shabaab. The argument that the FBI makes to explain their 2013 decision to classify her on the most wanted terrorist list cites the changing times from the 1970s to the 2000s. So what they say, uh, it's reported from Barbara Woodruff, uh, an FBI special agent and spokeswoman. So she says the FBI is quote, trying to bring the public's attention to the case since this case is 40 years old. So there may be people who don't know anything about it, end quote. Then she responds to the expected pushback that it's too much for Asada to be associated with the likes of the most wanted terrorist list. So this is where I think it gets really interesting. What she says then is, quote, I don't think it's extreme to have her on this list. Back in the 70s, when the BLA, the Black Liberation Army, were more active, they were looked at as part of an internal security investigation that eventually would have morphed into domestic security or domestic terrorism, end quote. So first, as Daniel's book shows, the state viewed the BLA as terrorists back in their heyday. So the state was very clear at the time that its problem was what the BLA was actually about and what they were actually doing at the time. That was the primary concern, not you know, some concern of, about what they would eventually morph into in the future. So the temporal logic of 
the FBI representative's argument is the temporal logic of counterterrorism. It's a logic of prevention and preemption, which is the very definition of counterterrorism, as Daniel's book shows. The punitive preventive measures of the war on terror mean punishment for something that has not been done on the belief that it just has not been done yet. So an application of that logic here results in this really bizarre kind of recasting of Asada as though she was not considered a terrorist before now. Even though the word showed up in newspaper headlines, she was called a black terrorist. Um, and the word also appeared on her New Jersey wanted posters. That phrasing eventually would have morphed into terrorists renders Asada and the BLA from 1970s revolutionaries into specifically post 9-11 terrorists, which is to say that they are to be read under a different or a new rubric. That's the Bureau's argument as I see it. So no matter how we interpret what the FBI representative said, what's clear is that she's differentiating in some way between the BLA then and terrorists now. Now, what Daniel's book argues against is a tracing of a direct linear continuity between the 1970s and today's counterterrorism. And the story of this FBI representative's convoluted argument is evidence of Daniel's point here. Her argument takes a twisted and circuitous route and employs some selective memory too in order to connect then and now, but in post 9-11 terms. It's a moment similar to the ones in the book's epilogue on the immediate aftermath of 9-11 and how that invokes 1970s uh, terrorism practices. So for example, how Sandiata Akoli, Marilyn Buck, and then also Arab and Muslim federal prisoners were all moved to solitary confinement immediately after 9-11. The book ultimately provides insight into moments of connection between then and now with a special concern for how the left understands that continuity. One of the hopes of the book is for readers to realize that the state is not omnipotent. As the book says on page 267, we can transform our world if we avoid the pitfalls of giving into cynicism or insisting on easy answers." End quote. So for me, part of realizing that the state is not omnipotent involves not accepting its arguments and narratives at face value without scrutiny. Doruba bin Wahad's critique of the left is particularly relevant here which takes us back to the story of Asada being added to the most wanted terrorist list. He argues that the younger generation of activists supporting Asada are actually doing a disservice. Part of the issue is that they accept the state's terms of what counterterrorism is and what it means. And this is his argument. He says that the classification of Asada as a terrorist serves the purpose of criminalizing black radical resistance to racist police repression and specifically how this resistance, or well, how Asada specifically was part of a legitimate political movement for human rights and self-determination. This is an attempt to rewrite history, he argues. Millennial activists, as he calls them, fall into this trap as well. He observes a generational difference that is at once and more importantly, a political difference. He says that millennial activists make her into a quote, black Madonna of abstract resistance, that they make her into a symbol that is disconnected from the movement she was part of and baptizes her as innocent based entirely on that disconnection. So for her supporters to make an argument for her innocence as Madonna in black, they have to argue that revolutionary violence and its goal of self-determination never happened and are merely excuses for beefing up law enforcement. This is a distortion of history, he says, and this is an aspect of this history of this time that Nixon's war at home really brings to light. There's much resonance then between the FBI's narrative of Asada as a terrorist and her supporters' arguments. 
Not only did the FBI representative misrepresent Asada's characterization as a terrorist as something new, but Asada's supporters received it as something new as well. Part of what I'm working on these days is to think about what an officially anti-racist politics has to do with this kind of misrepresentation, with specifically the erasure of third world politics in these historical distortions. So for example, it's not new at all that the Asadas of the 1970s would associate or be associated with the so-called Arab or Muslim terrorist. But that image of them together on the most wanted terrorist list is still shocking to many in 2013. And part of why it was shocking was due to a progressive or leftist desire, I would say, to hold on to some distinction between good black revolutionaries on the one hand and bad Arab or Muslim jihadis on the other hand. And, you know, that distortion is a product of many factors. But in any case, that's the misrepresentation and the subsequent misunderstanding that the image of Assad's face next to Al-Qaeda leadership appeals to. So what this story and Daniel's book show us is that counterterrorism is about intense performances and representations of remembering and forgetting. But the material side of things accumulates. We cannot settle for easy arguments that X replaced Y, like that Islamists replaced Soviets after the Cold War and so on. Rather, we need to maintain a sense of the accumulation and complexity. Otherwise, we're engaging on the same terms as counterterrorism discourse itself. Its representational method is to establish a singular enemy or target. But the material impacts and targets are vast. From black power to white power, communists of all colors and geographies, anti-imperialist movements at home and in the colonies and so on. So I'll end with where we started um, for my little section here to take seriously that 9-11 was not the start of counterterrorism is to get inside complicated and often convoluted arguments rather than tracing easy direct lines. It is to parse out representation from material reality. And Daniel's book makes a useful contribution to this endeavor. So I'll leave it there and um, looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Atia. Um, I want to introduce the last of our uh, speakers, last but certainly not least in terms of our panelists, uh, Mark Rudd, who is a longtime political organizer, a veteran of many of the uh, formations that are discussed in Daniel's book. Uh, he was a leader of the Columbia University chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, uh, as, well, as well as a veteran of the uh, Weather Underground. He's also served as a professor of mathematics at Central New, Mex New Mexico Community College. Uh, and he's the author of um, two uh, certainly relevant books, the 1990 memoir, uh, Truth and Consequences, The Education of Mark Rudd, as well as Underground, My Life with SDS and the Weatherman, uh, which was published by William Morrow in 2009. So it's great to have you here, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Looking forward to what you have to say. I think you might be on mute. There we are. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Cedra. Thank you, uh, and thank everybody else uh, for your comments. And especially thank, uh, thank you, Daniel. I, I, I'm, I'm blown away by so much of your book. Um, which I will mention. Um, just one little thing, uh, Cedric. Um, uh, there's only one book. Uh, <laughs> it came out in 2009. It's called uh, uh, Underground, My Life with um, uh, SDS and, and Weatherman. Uh, somehow or other, I had a, a, a working title called uh, Truth, Truth, Truth and Consequences or something like that, The Education of Mark Red, and, and it... It it, it, it it somehow uh, got onto um, Amazon, but it doesn't exist. There's only one book. Um, 
Daniel, uh, I I'm amazed by some of the stuff you came up with uh, in 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 uh, in in in, in uh, uh, Nixon's war. Um, I think I'll I'll begin by by uh, with 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 a, a, a couple of points um, um, concerning my amazement. Uh, one was um, I was amazed to find that. Uh, um, uh, this is more trivial and not my main concern. That Nixon actually knew that it was Mark that Mark felt was deep throat all along. I didn't know that, uh, and and um, uh, that indicates to me how 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 powerful a, a felt was that he he was able to um, continue as associate director. Uh, even though he was uh, spilling all the beans, um, and 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 what kind of internal um, uh, uh, um, uh, struggle there was going on within within the FBI, um, I uh, it's hard for me to believe that uh, J. Edgar Hoover um, uh, held back that he that that he was relatively uh, less uh, virulent uh, than 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 than. Uh, 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 some of the others uh, than, than, than Nixon himself, for example. Um, that, that's a minor point, although important. Um, my main concern in reading the book, though, is to understand the uh, relationship of left strategy to the, go to the government and its response. And and and, in a way, you in your epilogue, you 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 say, look at this amazing fact, that the Weather Underground and the Black Liberation Army were critical to the fall of a president of the United States. Talk about unintended consequences. <laughs> I mean, we 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 didn't know that was not what we started out to do. Uh, it, we started out to make revolution, uh, uh, and and yet we uh, somehow um, were able to uh, utilize the democratic structures, or rather, the democratic structures were still ex extant back then, fifty years ago. So that, for example, the Republican Party could split. In fact, it didn't really even split. It was united in getting rid of Nixon. That's an amazing fact. It says right there, fascism had not yet hit, although we thought it had. It, it took 50 years more. I was a member of, I was a, our group, the Weather Underground, was a faction of a much bigger organization, Students for Democratic Society, involving perhaps 100,000 active members on 400 college camp and high school campuses also post college and and our little group known as the weathermen first in in um, within SDS and later uh, weather underground decided ourselves our ideas you know maybe we represented at the most ever 500 people within SDS out of a hundred thousand we decided it was time to pick up the gun. The revolution has come. Off the pigs. Time to pick up the gun. Off the pigs. I mean, talk about fascist in a way. I look back on that and I say, well, that has nothing to do with democracy. It has to do with our will, which is pure fascism. But I'm not going to make a big deal of that point. What I want to make a big deal, though, is that the strategy had the opposite effect of what we thought it would. Um, is this wind uh, messing up the, the, the audio? Sort of. I'm, I'm at the top of a mountain, actually, and, and, and the, my, my phone doesn't work inside a, a house, so, and so there is a pretty big wind. The wind in, in, in New Mexico this spring has been horrible. And, and you probably read about the fires. Uh, not right here, but other places. Anyway, um, 
let me start. I, I'll try to be as brief as I can so we can have more conversation. When, when, when you're 20 years old and a, a white kid and you realize that your, your country is murdering millions of people in Vietnam and that it's, it's, it's a fundamentally racist society and, and that the violence is institutional on multiple levels, it's hard to know exactly what to do. And so black power hit us really hard, like right in the solar plexus. Black power was a challenge. It was saying, are you going to be a white liberal or are you going to stand up for what's right? You know? And so when I was 18 and I got to Columbia University, the first thing I heard was that white liberals always betray black, uh, have, have always have betrayed um, the black liberation struggle in the South. I said, I don't want to be a white liberal. I want to support revolution, and 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 uh, which is what 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 black power revolutionaries were talking about. And of course, that dovetails with the view of the whole world as being in revolution against primarily U.S. imperialism. So, I joined the cult of the gun. You, you one of the wonderful things in your book is you use that phrase. The cult of the gun. The only other time I've seen it used was in uh, The Darker Nations by V.J. Prashad. But other than that, I, nobody that I've ever talked with has ever mentioned uh, armed struggle as a cult. But it was. It really was. It had nothing to do with strategy. At best, it had to do with self-expression, but not strategy to win. Now that then leads me to another amazing thing about your book. It's the first time I've ever seen in print an accurate depiction of the Black Panther Party's relationship to armed struggle. There have been so many Black Panther books, memoirs, studies. There was one horrendous book called Black Against Empire that never mentioned armed struggle, not once. And, and never talked about the inevitable um, devolution into thuggery when you give young men guns, right? Which I think is one of, one of the best um, lessons you can get out of uh, a, a Black Panther story. But you, you had the guts to talk about the fact that much of the violence was initiated. It wasn't merely in response. It was a strategy. A terrible strategy, however, because it actually isolated the Black Panther Party from its base. And I was in Oakland, California in, uh, at the United Front Against Fascism. 80% of the people at that event were, were white. Uh, I was in Chicago after um, uh, uh, Fred Hampton was murdered in 1969. It, uh, there were black people, but it was primarily white people. When I, I was in um, New York, when we organized in support of the uh, New York um, 21, the Panther 21, in, in April of, of 1969, that was mostly all white people. The black masses, black people who had supported the, the Panthers, decided they did not want to stand up against this horrible repression that was coming down. Black people didn't want to die. But meanwhile, U.E.P. Newton would put out a, 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 an autobiography called Revolutionary Suicide. Anyway, I, I, what I'm trying to say is that you, the story you tell in your book is almost predictable that small groups picking up the gun will be labeled as criminal, terrorist, whatever, or insane, criminal, insane, or terrorist. It's inevitable because revolutionary violence cannot be understood by Americans ever under any circumstances. And even, even the, the, uh, the violence of anger uh, after someone uh, is, is murdered by the police, it cannot be understood as anything other than criminal or insane. 
And so it gives the, we gave, before the end of the war in Vietnam and before black liberation had, before the civil rights movement had moved in the direction it needed to move, which was, was class and economic, which Martin Luther King knew about, we, we prematurely said, no, we're going to follow this, this, this strategy, which is doomed to failure. And your book, I guess I'll stop now. Your book gives the mechanism of how it got doomed and how we got isolated. And none of that, what I'm saying has anything at all to, to do with our motives. I don't care about our motives. Atiyah, I really don't even care about uh, 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 anybody, uh, 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 anybody else's motives. I care mostly about effective strategy. And now the last thing I'm going to say is political power does not come from the barrel of a gun. Mao Tse Tung was wrong. Political power comes from the acquiescence and the consensus of the people. And that is what we have to keep in mind. So what I learned from that whole era of my life is don't do it again. Silence? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you so much, Mark. Um, I've got a few things I, I could say, but I actually want to give Daniel a chance to to uh, respond to Atia and Mark, and then um, we've got at least one question already from the uh, from the audience. So, Daniel, I think you're on mute. Thank you both for your comments. And um, we're talking about, like I wrote a book of, of history, you know, political history, social movement history, I'm trying to make some synthesis. But I wrote this hoping, coming from that background I explained earlier, that it could be part of informing conversations among people who are seriously committed leftists about strategy, about how to create a, a, a socialism that can win. And um, so like th that was the goal and, but it's emotional too. You know, I like, I have talked to a lot of people for, and I didn't do oral, I did some oral histories cause I had a different project on a different leftist guerrilla group before it turned into this book. Those are all on ice. And I've talked to many people off the record who have been in part of these groups. And there's a lot of different perspectives from Marx somewhere around there to like still we, still kind of towing a similar line to lots of stuff in between, but there's lots of trauma all around. And I don't know if there's ever going to be like a truth and reconciliation process of restorative justice and healing for like that generation of people. It might not happen, but that's real. And, um, you know, there's, so I, I'm just feeling that as I'm, as I want to respond to a couple things, but g given the limited time, I think I want to also just like be a little provocative in terms of kind of stirring up some conversation here. Or, um, like, but let me answer Phil's question about right-wing violence. Part of the interesting thing about this period is that it kind of is happening in terms of right-wing non-state violence, right? The, there's a, this, is, the, the, this leftist guerrilla violence is happening that kind of after the Klan in the South has been somewhat depressed, um, suppressed, um, part through by law enforcement, and there was a counterintelligence program against the Klan too. That was partly what modeled the the, the one that went after the black the black power movement. It's starting in '67. In September '68, it starts to target the, the Panthers, and it's really the the stated purpose is um, to pre to preemptively destroy an organization whose members are advocating killing the police and 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 armed revolution. And there is, uh, Mark, I think you got a mute there, um, please. Thanks. Um, although it's beautiful seeing um, the mountain up there in New Mexico. Um, and, um, you know, um, and 
I, one of the things I explain is that a, 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 an unintended consequence of that, while at the same time, you know, well, actually, let me come back to that. So this is happening. This this period, the 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 Klan in the South has kind of been undermined, and then there's a like another wave of white right wing violence that Kathleen Ballou talks about in her book. That's kind of really from 1979 with the the Greensboro massacre and picking up into some of these right wing militia and racist groups that kind of take on with the, following the Turner Diaries, a, a version of Foco theory which is what the left you which animated a lot of the leftist guerrilla activities, an apocalyptic kind of focal theory to, to try to press their white supremacist and um, right wing agendas. So that so so this period, there's there's definitely right wing state violence. I mean, Attica massacre. I talk about that in the book, not to mention the the, the violence in Vietnam and all the killing of, of, of radicals and Fred Hampton. But like in terms of non-state racist violence, it's more local and episodic. Um, so that that, but yeah, the focus of anti-terrorism becomes the left groups. Um, the oh, um, a couple of things I want to throw out. One of the in terms of orthodoxies, I think, and I was I I came across Cedric's essay that has just been published in in a book, you know, The Panthers Can't Save Us Now, which is a great essay, like as I was doing the revisions and I was like, God, I'm embarrassed that I haven't read this yet and didn't know about um, this work. Um, And I think it's been, uh, some of it has sadly been kind of ignored and a lot in the field. But one of the things that one of my, that some of the people I talked to had been movement veterans and including some in academia had said to me, like you can't take the re- the claims to revolutionary aims of the groups just at face value. Like on a material basis, was this a revolutionary moment? Did the left ever have the organized capacity to shut down the economy, to prevent the government from engaging in its daily, you know, um, operations? Or you know, and another, and this is another thing that's interesting to think about as we think about prison abolition in the wake of the last two years, which is I've been very influenced by, although I'll be honest, I've also started to rethink somewhat. Um, and, but like getting, getting up segments of the military or the police to support a revolutionary movement, that's kind of an ingredient, especially in a, um, so, you know, that the sixties was never a revolutionary moment. And I think that's important to recognize the, um, and the, I just want to throw out, like, I, you know, we can keep talking about the book and like some of the more contributions. I, I wanted to also say that I forgot to mention earlier that racialized suspect communities being targeted as a way to preempt this violence is a constitutive part of counterterrorism that develops here too. That evolves out of like under Johnson having a crisis from the urban uprisings or riots, especially after 1967, Detroit and Newark, where um, Hoover says to, um, I mean, Johnson says to Hoover, you got to find a way to prevent these in advance. That's when he starts doing the COINTELPRO first target in Stokely Carmichael. Um, You know, they're just, and but they also do a ghetto informant program, this totally ineffective thing where they try to get informants in every black urban community in the entire country. And it's, there's so much pressure on FBI agents. They start just making, they do paper informants. They just like make up stuff to, to file the reports and it never works. You have later, I, in the, I have a discussion, a, a chapter called the Arab scare after the, the attacks in black September in Munich, like the Arabs and Arab Americans are just harassed by the FBI all across the country. So because they can't, they don't have a way to find these people who are underground clandestine and they're under pressure to stop an attack. They create, they just target racialized communities and political suspect communities. But we make it, we, I think we're making a mistake if we just take that repression and understand that as being a reflection of the effectiveness of a political group in achieving its goals. Because that's some of the mythologies that COINTELPRO targeted the Black Panthers because they were so effective at creating change. And like, I'm not trying to like diss the Panthers, they've, they've influenced me. And, I'll, and what I, and I'm, I, like I said, I didn't do oral histories for this, but like, the legacies and how what that what that group means to people who are still alive or who've lived through it, it's a lot of different things. And some voices have been heard more than others. But I didn't get into all that in the book. But like I think that's a big 
myth. And like another thing I mentioned, I, it, you know, Ward Churchill's work, we, which which is really bogus, and and um, should stop. We should stop citing it. But one of his arguments in Agents for Repression is like, you know, it that if we do anything to try to create change, the FBI is just going to come after us and and like target us for assassination. And it's like that leaves us. You mentioned revolutionary suicide earlier. That's like the only direction that that leaves. If like the state is all powerful, that or going to graduate school. Um, sorry, so sorry to be a little provocative there. I went to graduate school and I'm hoping I like, but I think we need to like move the dialectic to another level and like really think about without demonizing or romanticizing as Cedric really put it in his article um, to think of, to be able to think with this generation in this moment, what, like how do we move to a society without prisons and mass incarceration and all the exploitation, climate change, and people just shooting each other up. So I'll back off, let it keep going. Uh, let me jump in and just make a couple of quick uh, comments sort of building on what's been said. Um, this is really great, I mean, on so many levels. Um, I think this book is helpful, especially at this moment when so many people are being politicized and, you know, as Daniel and, and um, Mark pointed out, you know, people are adopting views of history which aren't necessarily accurate, not necessarily uh, derived from study or some close understanding of, of uh, historical events, but rather we're cherry picking particular things and, and pulling out heroes wherever we feel they are and wherever they might be uh, necessary and service our contemporary needs. And so I think this work, this kind of work is always helpful in that regard. Um, one thing that dawned on me as I was reading the book, and maybe this would be something to to add, if not to, you can't add it to this book, but something in subsequent projects, right, would be to think about maybe a bit more closely the sociology of the 1950s and 60s and why um, it would be so easy, as Mark pointed out, for the Panthers or the Weather Underground to be so isolated from the rest of the American uh, public, right, where you know, this is a period in which so many Americans uh, are not embracing revolution, but they're veering towards much uh, deeper commitments towards capital and much more in the way of a commitment towards Cold War patriotism. It's certainly not everyone in the society, but there are many Americans who are doggedly defending, um, you know, liberal democratic values, people who are... Uh, not opposing the Vietnam War, right? There are Americans and segments of the population who are growing more conservative. And so I think there's a way in which we could talk about um, the, the history of the Black Panther Party, the history of uh, SDS and the Weather Underground that situates them within a society that really wasn't so hospitable at certain times, certainly by the time Nixon is elected, not as hospitable to the kinds of revolutionary uh, aims or ideals that they are, are um, pushing for. Another thing that's always struck me about um, the embrace of Che Guevara or uh, Carlos Marighella during this period is that those people operated in very different historical contexts, right? And I think, you know, the point that I tried to make or have made in, in different places in my work is that the idea of armed struggle as it's adopted by people who are fighting against Portuguese colonialism in different parts of, of Africa, folks who are fighting in Vietnam, is very different. I mean, in, in so many ways from the kinds of things that are adopted within the United States by the new left and by black power radicals. I mean, for one, the kinds of armed struggles that unfold in different parts of the third world took years um, to achieve the kind of consent from, from peasants, populations, and, you know, people in urban areas before they could actually engage in, in active uh, combat, right, in order to have the support of various publics. Took years to build, right? It wasn't a, an overnight thing. But here in the United States, right, we're dealing, with, again, with this situation where you've got um, committed and radical uh, groups but nowhere near the kinds of public uh, support for the things that they're pushing for. And I think this gets lost in so many conversations about the 1960s. Um, 
where there was support for the Panthers, I think it was relatively shallow and dissipated quickly. I mean, there was support for, um, you know, the court cases where people felt that Black Panthers were being framed and railroaded, you know, so you were able to build support in that regard. But to argue that there was actual support for the 10-point uh, program or even more so for uh, third world revolutionary ideals, it just was not there. And I think that is something that we need to think about um, in a really careful sense now, as we've seen the rebirth of, you know, uh, socialism in, in so many different places, uh, but, but oftentimes not a whole lot of clarity as far as what socialism means um, for many of the people who, who now say that they support it. So I just think that again, the, the you know, going back to Mark's point about uh, consensus, right? How do you build uh, majority support for the kinds of things that um, we on the left want, right? And build it from, the, from brick by brick from the ground up, right? How do we achieve that? There's one question that I think is uh, for uh, Dan, and I'll read it out for the benefit of folks who may not have may not have seen it. It says your book relies a lot on FBI files, but lots of FBI records have been destroyed or remain secret, and other FBI records are full of errors, both malicious and uh, inadvertent. Do you see a risk in believing or relying on FBI sources in this way? I think this is also a question for Atia, somebody else who's working heavily within. Um, you know, the FBI uh, archive, um, how much can we trust the FBI record keeping? Or should we trust those? Yeah, thanks. I'll try to just answer it quickly just to say that just like any other source you use to do historical research, you have to look at it critically. One thing to understand about the FBI documents is they were never meant to see the light of day. These are and never, few were never imagined people would see them. And yeah, some of them have misinformation um, or m mistakes. Sometimes they have very accurate descriptions and under and sophisticated understandings of leftist ideas and and, and, and um, philosophies and, and and that sort of a thing too. So um, there's a need to use criticism. I, I wrote a, another piece in Jacobin actually that. Um, there was a controversy a couple of years ago because somebody, a, a historian, wrote something about Martin Luther King that was very provocative in a right wing website and create about his sex life and, and counterintelligence. And I wrote a response to that, critically looking at the documents and how he used them, um, which was in an irresponsible way. Um, the short version is that, um, is that. You know, I was very careful with the different documents I looked at to try to, to, to use that balance and criticism. And I have lots of footnotes where in cases where there's ambiguity or or where it does look like the FBI has got something wrong or they're exaggerating or they're using counterintelligence information warfare that it that is there. But a, a bit a big a bit a lot of people think the challenge with researching FBI history is that there's so much missing. And it's true, there's a lot that's declassified, some things we may never know. But there's also just so much that's been printed. A challenge for me was to try to see the forest from the trees and to cut through some of that. And that's what I tried to do was have a synthesis that's gonna go beyond this kind of research. A, 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 a lot of the work on the FBI has been kind of expository, like expose, here's all the horrible things the FBI did. And it's certainly a litany, but I was trying to understand a more of a dynamic of cause and effect um, and political power struggle and change over time. But I'd love to hear um, Atia talk about this too. Yeah, I think this is a great question. And, um, you know, you have the kind of like uh, standard FBI books that sort of take FBI records and the book is all about FBI bureaucracy, how paper moves through the system, you know, when each, you know, group inside of the bureau started, what they do. So, you know, but I think for anyone who studies the FBI and uses FBI records, the kind of um, uh, obvious move, and this is something that, uh, that I'm working on in, in uh, my own research is not just cross-referencing, but to look at the work and the thought that's been produced by the people that the FBI is producing records about. So, you know, the FBI has their narrative that we can treat not as an authoritative account of reality, but as an object of, as, you know, an entity that's produced knowledge 
and that's what they do. But then, you know, um, the Panthers, the PLA, whether former Weather Underground members have all produced all kinds of writing. And I don't think that reading and working with those writings is necessarily to romanticize them. But I think these are all thinkers in their own right and to treat them uh, not as objects of knowledge, but as producers of knowledge to see what they've said and why they've said it. They are theorists too. They are, um, you know, they're they're not just people who have picked up arms, right? But they they have read, you know, um, the way that we academics read and study other texts written by fellow PhDs, written by thinkers in the past who were flawed in any number of ways. I think a similar approach. Um, is necessary for reading FBI documents and then also counterweights against them. I don't know if Fatih or Daniel had this experience, but when I was a graduate student um, researching uh, the African Liberation Support Committee and the National Black Political Assembly, uh, two organizations from the, the 70s, um, what was interesting, sometimes the FBI files had like obscure documents that the activists themselves no longer had possession of, right? So I'm, I'm thinking of meeting agendas and, you know, uh, copies of leaflets and other things that they circulated. Um, so there's that odd way in which the, the FBI, as despite its own narrative and its own motivation, sometimes um, becomes an unintended archive of, of some of these social movements, right? Um, I don't think we have any other questions from uh, the, the audience just yet. Actually, we do have one. Um, Daniel mentioned the book, Catherine uh, Ballou, Bringing the War Back Home, which documents the rise of the white power movement. I have a question to pose uh, about the, its relevance to our current moment. Um, I don't know. Is this a? Oh, go ahead. You wanna? You wanna? You wanna <laughs> I, I'm question? sorry. That was, that was a private no session. Right? But but now that I'm in here, uh, I I will sort of ask the question. Uh, uh, you brought up the book uh, "Bringing the War Back Home" by Catherine Ballou, which is a a sort of a, a narrative of the last cycle of struggles with the Black Power movement. I'm sorry, the white power movement. It starts with uh, uh, sort of right-wing Vietnam vets feeling stabbed in the back after the war. Uh, there's an incident with Vietnamese fishermen in Texas. Uh, a lot of them are part of the Soldier of Fortune crew that secretly helps out the Contras, goes down in the Civil War. Uh, they come up with the idea of leaderless cells uh, with the notion that is not well known that uh, their goal is uh, to essentially that they, they think that the, the Russians and the U.S. are going to fight a nuclear war, which will disorganize the government so they can actually seize control. I mean, utterly crazy. Uh, but it then goes to the point where it leads essentially to Tim Timothy McVeigh and the blowing up of the Mura building in uh, Oklahoma City. Uh, so while all this is happening, uh, the role of liberals has been essentially to punch left and reach across the aisle to the right. That is to say, they basically uh, uh, throw out great laments about each of these events or saying, you know, democracy is threatened, but nobody does anything. And this right wing movement keeps growing. Uh, so we're in a position now where uh, for many years, uh, the the right, even the official right, uh, has uh, thought of, uh, I, I'm sorry, the liberals think the left is a greater threat to them than the right, which has become fascist, which means that essentially nobody is obstructing that power in any way or dealing with it effectively. So we get to the point where you have this thing on January 6th which is an attempted insurrection. And uh, there's some question, as with everything, if it'll get beyond procedural votes and anything can be done because essentially, like ha as happened in the interwar years, uh, 
right? When the fascists, the Nazis got into the parliament, their goal was to make it not work and obstruct everything. So we're at that point now where we have a really dangerous white ring movement and it seems that there are no weapons to stop them. So I'm wondering how you see strategically some sort of move at this moment to diffuse this very dangerous situation, which is happening like a slow motion train wreck before everybody's eyes, but where the people who sort of have some elements of governmental power to uh, apply force to stop them are not doing it. And the people who are outside the ability to apply force uh, are maybe re uh, reduced to feudal gestures or, or expression. Or how do you get beyond making gestures and bits of self-expression and apply sort of effective force to put this back? I mean, how do you see that at the moment? It's a moment that's very different from the moment where Mark and the Panthers operated, where, for example, in 1971, when you had the Vietnam vets march on Washington, you had sitting senators from both parties who came out and camped with the vets on the mall to express solidarity. That's inconceivable at the moment. So where are we? Where do we go next? How do you see it applying the lessons you've learned from the 60s? to this moment? That's my question. Mark, did you want to say anything about that before I say something based on the research? Because you haven't spoken in a little bit. I think, he, I think we lost him. Did we? Oh, whoops. Um, okay. The, oh, wait, wait. He's, he's back again. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Daniel, you can start us out and then yeah. Mark can join us. All right. Thanks, Cedric. Just a couple things um, I wanted to say about the 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 right in counterterrorism is that, and, and I discussed this in the epilogue, but even earlier than that. Um, for, for, so one of the things I try to show is that um, the state was not all powerful. Like um, many on the left, including the Panthers, portrayed in their in the in the the Black Panther newspaper and in other publications the various sorts of repression that were coming down from the Nixon administration, the FBI, and various police agencies as all sort of a centralized fascist plot um, that was evidence of their effectiveness in creating a revolutionary change. And in reality, you know, there was, I, I, there was asymmetrical violence, but bullets flying both ways, even back, you know, when Huey Newton after Detroit is saying like, we need to take Foucault theory and basically turn these uprisings into a guerrilla warfare situation. And people, an underground wing of the Panthers started forming right after that. Don Cox talked about it in his um, posthumous um, memoir. And, and, and so, so, so but as counterterrorism developed and there's a couple different institution attempts at creating the first institutions dedicated to counterterrorism during this era. The first is the Houston plan, which was gonna unite all of the, the uh, or consolidate the power of all the, the federal intelligence agencies under the White House and bring back all the illegal surveillance tactics. It was torpedoed by Hoover because of a jurisdictional bureaucratic struggle because over who should authorize this stuff and why and not wanting to get caught because of leaks. After During Watergate, after the Munich attacks, there's another um, attempt there's a, a counterterrorism, um, federal counterterrorism organization developed called the Committee to the Cabinet Committee to Combat Terrorism. But it's very weak. It's basically just doing policy analysis. Um, and it's because, you know, Nixon in the midst of, of Watergate didn't want to try to, to, to go for consolidating all that power. And he's already had set up his plumbers by then, but now he's dealing with, with Watergate. But like after Watergate and the, the, the communist victory in Vietnam, the um, a lot of America and, and all of the revelations about FBI surveillance, CIA and sass assassinations, you know, including with Lumumba in Congo, when all that stuff comes out, a lot of Americans are, are really disgusted and upset about, about this and what it means for their national identity, more so than some of the guerrilla activity that's continuing. But then, you know, you have the Iran, Iran hostage crisis that goes on for 444 days and you know, around 1979, starting in 1979, actually right around the time Assad Shakur's liberated is when that starts, incidentally. But um, 
after that, Reagan comes into office making counterterrorism this big part of his agenda. While he's, of course, exporting terrorism around the world in the name of anti-communism, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and the Contras in Nicaragua among the most ex um, explicitly. But what, so what you have happening is actually some of the, you have somebody like Strom Thurmond, a former segregationist and anti-communist. He, all throughout the, the church committee era, when there's the big Senate investigations of the intelligence units, he's taken this relic of McCarthyism, the internal security committee of the, um, the Senate Judiciary Committee, and holding these like one-man hearings of all these kooks, these anti-communists who are talk, doing hearings on the, the Symbionese Liberation Army um, and the Weather Underground and, and, and prison, uprisings in prisons, all in the name of like terrorism, right? And saying we need to bring back all these surveillance powers. Well, when, after the Reagan revolution, Strom Thurmond gets put in charge of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which Ted Kennedy had, had briefly been chairing. Before that had been um, Eastland from Mississippi, who's a bit, another big segregationist. But like he, he, then take, he then makes a new subcommittee that's a subcommittee on terrorism, which is full of those freshman like Republican senators. So like those, and then you also have the first joint terrorism task forces, these interagency FBI led um, units going after in the, going after leftist remaining leftist guerrilla groups, New York, Chicago, and Boston between 1980 and 1983. So that's so though that's when you start having this counterterrorism being institutionalized, and like Atiyah was saying, like um, you know, starting to 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 frame and target racialized communities or political communities, um, and so from then on. We see really counterterrorism existing within the political economy that also you have mass incarceration and neoliberalism and being really a tool of the right. After the, 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 um, the Oklahoma City bombing, you got the, the terrorism legislation that came out in 1996. The, it was all watered down by Republicans doing some of the same thing you're seeing now, the pushback against the Buffalo shooting and not wanting to have um, you know white conservatives being targeted for mass surveillance the way that like black people and leftists and um, people from the Middle Eastern or suspected Middle Eastern Arab Muslims, it changes over the years, communities are targeted. Um, so it's, it's really been targeted at the right. And, you know, uh, uh, Mattia wrote a, a really good essay that um, I cited in the book about like abolishing counterterrorism. Um, I still think we need to talk about like how do we address this kind of violence? Um, and that's a that's a strategic question too. But I'll stop there. Mark got cut out, but well, actually, Cedric's facilitates. So I'll just stop. <laughs> Mark, did you want to contribute uh, and respond to that that question by Philip? Well, let me unmute. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, it, it, I, it, Daniel's history, uh, personal history, is interesting because he says he came through the animal rights movement. And as I remember, the animal rights movement was one of the first mass social movements that got targeted, essentially a nonviolent movement, but got targeted as being terrorist with something called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. Daniel, you probably know somewhat more about this than I do, but literally people have been jailed for using, com for conspiracy to violate the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act for using computers to advocate a boycott certain corporations that use animals for testing. Now, that, that, that's the widest possible um, definition of terrorism, uh, to, 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 to do more than $10,000 worth of damage to a corporation or any other entity that uh, involves animals is terrorism. Daniel, that, the question of the definition of terrorism comes up repeatedly in your book. And, and I, I really would like you to, to address that. Um, uh, but, but 
I, I want to say one thing about it. Terrorism means bad, criminal. That's all it means. It doesn't mean anything else. When we murder people in Baghdad with shock and awe, it's terrorism. It's not terrorism. It's good thing. When Putin murders people in, uh, 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 in, in eastern uh, uh, Ukraine, that's terrorism. So it's, it's an amazingly elastic uh, definition. All of this leads me to believe that Martin Luther King Jr. was right on multiple levels. Strategically, there's only one strategy that's possible, and that's nonviolence. And I believe that political action is what's needed. The left is absolutely deficient right now. The right has a political party called the Republican Party. The left does not have a political party. We should have taken over the Democratic Party starting from 1970 and really taken it over and really gone for power. But leftists, liberals, we don't want power. It's too, da it's too dirty. It takes too much effort. The fucking idiots who don't even believe in science and believe in the free market in some magical way, they, those idiots, went for power. We, brilliant people, like the brilliant people on this panel, we did not go for power. We're outside power. And, and, and it, it, it just drives me nuts. Next week, I'm going to be 75 years old. And I'm going to die never knowing power or anything like it. And, and to this day, we do not have people rushing into the Democratic Party to grab the party the way the fucking idiots grab the Republican Party. So I, I, I would like Red May to talk about why we are not in power. So maybe uh, maybe my question uh, wasn't clear enough. There was no sort of subtext underneath it that said all these things are happening now. We're under great threat. Therefore, we need to revive the weatherman strategy and blah blah blah. That was not it. I mean, accepting to a certain degree the the uh, its utter. Uh, uh, a lack of a fit with the this, this situation, uh, the notion of taking FOCO techniques, which didn't even work in Latin America, and trying to move them, make them work in New Jersey, uh, you know, is somewhat crazy. I'm not advocating any particular strategy. However, I am pointing out one thing, which is to say that essentially uh, the, the liberals who have the, ha the hands of power at the moment literally don't understand the danger the extent of the danger that they're they're facing from a kind of fascist attempt to end democracy once and for all, and 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 put in a kind of, uh, you know, a kind of white, a white government, or whiter than white that already is. So all I was saying is, given the fact that the left has made a lot of mistakes, and we find ourselves where we are now, and. Uh, the right is so well organized that they both have occupations, uh, occupied spaces within the government, like the Supreme Court and other things, and the state houses, uh, and and plus, you know, they all they all have guns, AR-15s, and something like that. The question is, what do we do now? It's the, the same question. I do want to say one thing though about power, and that is that it, it seems to me. Uh, that when we divide the possibilities between violence and nonviolence or violence and elections, we're kind of missing a kind of uh, an area which I'll call force, uh, which the right is expert at using, which the left have, hasn't figured out with. Mitch McConnell doesn't engage in violence, but he wields power, the acts of power of force. Uh, he doesn't engage in uh, uh, negotiations or, or uh, discussion about what he's going to do. He forces things through. He finds the levers of power and does what he does. Uh, the, the left used that power 
against the WTO, where they sat down in front of the entrance to the WTO and stopped the conference. People couldn't get inside. There are a whole range of tactics, imaginative tactics, that one could start to develop or think about because we're beyond the point where the laws are going to act automatically to protect us from fascism. We know that that doesn't work. You know, even though liberals still feel, you know, my God, they're breaking the law, but, you know, where they have nothing to enforce a particular law if, uh, if the right decides within Congress that they're just not going to obey it. What's the next move? You know, that's all I'm saying. Whoops, Mark cut out. Uh, does that make any sense? Out, let me throw out one last question, sort of building on what Philip just said. Um, you know, it seemed like with the with the January 6th insurrection, right, one of the responses we heard from uh, people on the left, folks involved with Black Lives Matter was, you know, why didn't the state respond to the insurrectionists with the same sort of uh, repression that they did to Black Lives Matter protesters uh, a year earlier. And um, we've also heard in the aftermath of the, the January 6th insurrection, um, many folks on the left calling for these right-wing militias and other armed groups to be declared as terrorists, right? Um, and I think, Part of my question uh, for Atia and and Daniel and Mark, if he comes back, is how do we how should we think about the relationship between the left and the state and force, as uh, Philip just pointed out? I mean, because in some ways, um, how do you maintain public safety? How do you protect civilians from the kinds of actions that we've seen? Um, which now are not even connected to some, in some cases, grand revolutionary or, or political projects, but are random and, and uh, you know, in some cases um, coming from particular idiosyncratic and personal um, concerns or, or breakdowns that people are having, right? So I, I think we're in, in many ways, as I said at the very beginning, um, we're in a very different context where the country is much more heavily armed, where we do have, uh, you know, fascist elements that are out and in full force and ready to, to act. We've seen on the left and in, in Black Lives Matter and other corners, people who've tried to counter that by creating their own um, black gun clubs and, you know, not fucking around coalition and other kinds of, of armed groups that are responding to what they see as the need to protect um, you know, protesters and other folks. And so I think we're in a much more volatile situation in many ways than we were in in the 1960s and still not a revolutionary uh, situation at all, right? If anything, one which may veer in the very direction that we don't want, right? Not towards some sort of left uh, politics that we might embrace and that might become popular. We're heading towards something that may be disastrous. And so I'm just, I'm just curious again about this. How do you see this relationship between the state and force and left politics at this particular moment? Just building off of what, what uh, Philip introduced here. You want to go ahead, Dan? I was going to offer it to you first because you haven't talked as much, but I can't. Yeah, I mean, what I have to say is really quick. So Go for you go, you go, and then I'll say something. Um, one thing that, that Philip said that I want to pull back in is just how different things are now compared to the 60s and 70s. And one of the ways that things are different, to your question, Cedric, on the relationship between the left, the state, and force is that the technologies of force that the state has now are just far more advanced. And certain things that um, could happen in the 60s and 70s can't happen now without it being a suicide mission. And that changes the terrain. Um, but one thing, another thing that's very different between the 60s, 70s and now, uh, to my earlier point about the, the theoretical work of left at, the left at the time, um, is that I think we're really lacking a coherent politics on the left right now, something that can accommodate everybody who would fall under that umbrella or who the left cares about. 
And so there's a lot of room for serious political thought. And I know that's not the, you know, okay, here's the program, here's what we do next. But I do think that it is the missing ingredient that makes it really difficult for the left to be a powerful force or an, as influential a force as it has been at different points in the past. Um, so, so there's room for, for developing um, a politics that, you know, like you said, Cedric, is not idiosyncratic or personal, um, but can really accommodate what it needs to. Yeah, I think those are really good points. And to add to my thoughts on those questions, um, I think that, I mean, I, I mentioned how counterterrorism has really become a tool of the right, although, you know, we know that Democrats have mainstream and the leaders of the Democratic Party have gone along with that a lot. I mean, invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan and, you know, all aspects of the war, various aspects of the war on terror. And I don't think, <clears throat> you know, actually Atia in the essay I mentioned earlier said, you know, let, like, let's recognize that the, the, this term terrorism has always been racialized and politicized and like to just kind of like try to move it over to, to like, fo to, to, to focus on white supremacists too. Like that's not realizing like what it's always been. And um, there's, but people are still gonna do that because it's terrorizing and it's violent and it's scary. But I, the moment we're in now, I mean, in terms of strategy, what to do, I mean, the Republican party has basically, they're supposed to be, they're the, t the party of anti-terrorism and law and order, yet they all lined up during Bush's second, I'm, I'm sorry, Trump's second impeachment in the Senate to, to keep him in office, right? And the hypocrisy is just so blatant that these, the, the, the question of like, what does law and order and terrorism mean now is, is really thrown into question. But yeah, they'd have power. And now what they're trying to do, you know, is with voter, various voter suppression laws is is seize power and minority minority rule through the what means that can be considered legitimized, and then once they do that, you know what are they going to do? They're going to pardon all the January six um, people who've been arrested. They've got Guantanamo at their disposal. The, the the tools of the war on terror. That's pretty scary. So what does the left do? Well, organ organizing constituencies of working class people, something that Cedric has hammered home in his work, and is what I think we need to do. That's really hard. And it's really hard to do that from scratch. And often what we have on the left is, and this is partly a legacy of the 60s, I think, too, is in like the media attention. And now social media just screwing it all up is a lot of posturing and tearing each other down, you know? And um, I think that's hard. And we need to try to move beyond that. I mean, Adolf Reed wrote a, an essay like um, The Whole Country is the Reichstag. I think that's a, a, an important thing to be thinking about right now. I mean, he's, and like, he's talking about a left liberal coalition. How do we, you know, until we can actually build more power on the left, just to kind of keep fascism, American fascism at bay. Um, and it's not like, it's not easy, to, easy, but I, I kind of think that's where we are. And yeah, we got to move beyond the leftist cannibalism to try to do that, I think. But I'm curious to know, I don't know, when's the time up on this thing? Are, are we up or are we still going? Because I'm curious to know, like, in your areas, what you see about that going on. But, um, yeah. I, I thought we were going to 130, but. Uh, we can go a little I mean, longer. I mean, it's an important discussion. Cedric, uh, do you have a vision here? I actually had a question that I've been sitting on uh, that I want to ask. Um related to the book and and I think I think it relates to uh Atiyah's work as well. You know, when I'm when I, as I read Nixon's War at Home, you know, it, it to me it 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 shares common ground uh to some of the other it shares some common ground with some of the other works on mass incarceration that look at the 1960s as sort of this big bang moment, right? That it's really the beginnings of um the carceral expansion and so you know different works come to mind um jordan camp uh heather thompson elizabeth hinton and others and so i have like two questions one which is fairly straightforward which is how do you see your work uh in relation to those other works right and is it is it fair to say that you're all on, on common ground or 
what ways do you see your work as, as being distinct from those? And then the other question, which is a little bit more critical and maybe one, you know, again, for both you and, and uh, Atia, um, I, uh, I guess I'm, 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 I'm curious or concerned about the focus on the federal government in the genesis of mass incarceration when we've seen so many works, you know, in recent years that have really focused on the local, right? That it's really, you know, uh, the, the carceral expansion really happens at the local level. Um, on that same note, you know, when we think about the repression of 60s radicals, right? I mean, on the one hand, we could focus on the FBI um, and their collaboration with local law enforcement. But some of these local law enforcement were already you know, even before uh, Cointelpo, they were already engaged in uh, persecution of, of communists, persecution of radical trade unionists, black activists. And so I'm, I'm concerned or, or, you know, curious about the relationship between um, what you all have studied and local law enforcement. And then I'm also concerned about whether, you know, whether we should focus so much on the repression of uh, radical movements as the beginning point of um, the carceral expansion, or whether the, the origins really lie somewhere else, right? Not so much in the kinds of repressive apparatus that's brought to bear. And, and it's, it's clear, right? The first SWAT team used against the Black Panther Party, right, in, in Los Angeles, right? So there's those moments where it's really clear. Um, but but we know that, that uh, police are being deployed in all sorts of ways. And some have argued, you know, people like uh, John Clegg and Adenair Usmani uh, and others that it's really, um, you know, the cultural expansion as we as we know it, as we as we witness it during the same historical period, a lot of it is driven by real crime, right? And I know that for some people on the left, and certainly for some folks who write about mass incarceration, people style themselves as abolitionists, focusing on real crime you know, might seem like a, a too much of a, um, a concession to right wing, you know, arguments. Um, but I'm, I want to hear more about that, right? The role of crime in cities, both survival crimes, um, the scourge of heroin and later crack cocaine in the 80s, uh, as well as organized crime, which, you know, again, during the 1960s, right, a tremendous amount of both uh, federal, but also local law enforcement activity is geared towards uh, reining in organized crime. Why? Because there are various constituencies, local merchants, um, chambers of commerce, uh, public officials who are trying to revamp and bring you know folks back downtown. They're all concerned about the problems of organized uh, crime. So I'm, I'm wondering how do those things fit into these narratives, right, that you all have already uh, constructed about the FBI. Should I go first, or is, um, I can I can say that we're talking about my book. I guess I'll go do that, and I'd love to hear from Atia too. So, in terms of this book, um, yeah. So, I I think one of the things I was thinking about, you know, a lot of the literature on mass incarceration does focus, I think a little, maybe a little more heavily on the national and I'll come back to that. And I think we need to look at the local, but one of the things I was thinking about this moment is like this, in the broadest sense, this punitive turn as it's sometimes been called, we know the carceral state and prisons and American politics has often been punitive, but in terms of like this shift, this shift we talked about earlier, I was trying to think about when, like, if there was going to be a power to move the country in a different direction, it would have been from the left, right? And so much of the lore that I've seen about the decline of the left is saying, like, COINTELPRO, like, destroyed the left. And, and so I, I wanted to look into that and, the, and also realizing that the discussion of counterterrorism and its emergence has not been really discussed in the, that literature. So I think that's, I, I, you know, the way I talk about the punitive of term and mass incarceration is in somewhat broad brushstrokes. And I'm looking in more granular way at these conflicts between um, the guerrillas and, and the state and, and, then the, and, and within the state and then those relationships to the broader political changes. And I do think that 
some of the literature. Yeah, there, there's this weird way in which a lot of literature wants to say like violence and crime, which we know is a social construction of what's crime and what's not, but like anti-social crime or political violence by non-state actors, like as if that just has no role in the history. And like, we can understand it's it's a, we can understand, I think if we want to have a more sophisticated understanding of change over time and the past that we can use to inform moving forward, we have to be able to acknowledge that. So just like, I'm trying to under, I, I try to do a fair job of really understanding what the people who turn embrace guerrilla warfare, why they do it and where they're coming from, while at the same time realizing that, yeah, when they started doing this violence, there's an effect and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a pushback and a back and forth and a dialectic. So, I mean, just one example is that federal, um, you know, the, the, the U S government starts, um, put in um, metal detectors in airports and in, in courthouses. And it does bring down the number of, of, of airplane hijackings in the U S there was, and there was a, a lot of them in the sixties. It was be starting to become like really normal. And, and most of them actually weren't done by leftists, but there was a few that were, they were trying to go to Cuba or Algeria. Um, but um, like we, so, so, and we also looking at like how opportunists like Hoover or Nixon played up those incidents of violence for their own agenda, their own law and order agenda, right? And and um, and and that continues even further with Reagan, you know, trying to move away from funding on social programs to funding militarism and and, and um, policing instead, you know, um, and, and you know, playing into all that. And so, you know, sadly, a lot of this girl activity kind of played into that law and order agenda. But I do think, in terms of the chronology, like you said, um, you mentioned Clegg and Usmani, and like some, th there needs to be some better. I'm hoping like the the literature will improve and kind of bring the like bring some more synthesis because some of it has been not not as great. But I want to shout out actually my colleague at Western, Peter Pios, wrote a was really great article about Chicago. And in the in in this new anthology on the war on drugs that just came out, where he's looking more, he's looking at how like um, propaganda use of violent crime by by different different factions like played into um, the the efforts to kind of roll back what um, um, Mayor uh, Washington, Harold Washington, right, um, his 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 efforts to you know. Um, get at more root causes of violence. So, like, I just want to shout out that essay and like look at like he's making the argument that we have to look at the local and the timeline of mass incarceration to developing later. But um, so so yeah. So that, I hope I answered your question there. Um, we'll let you off the hook. <laughs> I can say more, but does Atia want to say something? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I kind of have like two or three things that I want to say. Um, I mean, I don't I don't make claims to to locating the origins of mass incarceration or doing any kind of research on local express like local law enforcement and what that looks like. So but I what I do want to say, though, is I think there is still something to be said about the FBI and federal law enforcement things we don't understand or that we think we understand because we have these stock narratives of what happened, you know, like Pro. just that word does a lot of work, right? But there's so much around that. There's earlier versions of Pro. there's racial, Raycon racial conditions that targeted the nation of Islam. There's, I mean, like for what I work on, which is on uh, race and Muslims and repression in the U.S., you know, we have a kind of stock narrative about, for example, how, what, you know, what happened to Asada Shakur, what is happening to her. But with just a tiny bit of digging in archives that are even just available online for anybody to access, we can see that for a few years in the 70s, she was a Muslim. And through her court cases, through her, um, when she went on trial for the New Jersey Turnpike shootout, a central issue in that trial was her religious freedom to not have court on Fridays. So these are things that we have narratives about what happened to her, but that religious freedom case played a major role in the outcome of the trial, which was that not only was she sentenced to life, but life plus 30 or 33 years. 
based on, uh, you know, contempt of court for not standing up for the judge when he walked in the room on the grounds that as a Muslim, I'm not going to stand up for the judge. So these are parts of this history that we have a story, but we don't fully understand it really well. And the other thing I want to say that might seem a little bit unrelated is that, you know, I'm trained as a sociologist. So, you know, crime, the social construction of crime, that's our whole thing, right? And even there, I think there are aspects to the FBI that we don't fully understand very well. So, you know, as far as crime is concerned, um, a like a one, there, there are sort of two major thinkers, two major like men of science that Hoover thanks and gives credit to for developing FBI identification practices um, in the late 19th century, mid and late 19th century. And that's the, um, the Belgian astronomer Adolf Quetelet and the French um, police prefecture scientist Alphonse Bertillon. And what both of them did was develop ideas about what it means to be human based on you know, what it means to be a kind of European man. And everybody else got measured in relation, literally measured, their bodies literally measured in relation to, to that fictitious being that they created. So the FBI's identification practices today are still informed by that model. And our understanding of crime as any kind of deviation from that man um, is still informed by that. So, you know, on the one hand, there's these ideas of crime. And on the other hand, I think for the left to think about is other is, is you know, actual notions of safety and security. Crime is one thing. And actual safety is a whole other question. And I think, you know, like Cedric, you mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, this uh, school shooting that's weighing on everybody. How can't it that that's an issue of not actual safety, whether you want to call it crime or not, does does very little for understanding what's happening or even for stopping it. But um, yeah, questions of actual safety. Thank you so much. I don't know. Do we have any other questions from the uh, from the chat? There's a question in comments. I'm trying to look. If you look at comments, it's uh, oh. it's the more comments from uh, Steve Lee, and I'll read them out. There was polarization in the '60s, but 25 percent of young black people identified with the BPP. One million students call themselves revolutionary. Movements to the left, anti-war, women's liberation, etc., were effective and drew support. The ruling class had to give concessions because of mass public support. Uh, Nonviolence or violence is a tactical question. There have been and will be many situations when violence is necessary. The Russian Revolution victory needed armed struggle after winning the majority. So those are some general principles, how applicable they are to each specific conjuncture in America, I leave to our guests to figure out, or even our viewers, right? I think we are pretty much coming down to the the end mark. Uh, maybe everybody uh, could make a final short statement, and then we can bid adieu to our audience. and. Uh, all go to the bars or wherever we wherever we head after discussions. That's what we're missing. We don't have the real face to face yeah. thing here, right? Yeah. I think I'll I'll uh I'll see my time to to Daniel and and Atia uh, as far as like closing closing statements. Well, I just want to say thank you for anyone who's watching it, anyone who's got this far and or is this far watching the video. I'd like to thank you all. I wish we could all go have some beers together or, or eat some food together or something like that. And I hope we can do it again in the future. But I, I just want to thank everyone for this conversation. All I have to add is the same thing. Thanks and congratulations again, Dan, on your book. Um, it was a really good conversation and thank you all. So I want to thank both Daniel and Cedric and 
Atia. That shouldn't be both. That should be everyone. And uh, to thank Mark, who, who uh, the uh, intricacies of electronics have dropped in and out of our particular uh, uh, conversation. I, I appreciated him trying to reach us from the top of that mountaintop in Mexico. I found it, the, the sight of it and the wind uplifting to my soul as I looked at it. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see that Mark uh, has as, still has as much energy now as he did when he was my uh, doubles partner in freshman tennis at Columbia before he uh, ended up uh, heading SDS and leading the takeover of the university. So Mark, uh, happy New Mexico. And uh, the conversation continues at Red May. Everybody is welcome back anytime. Uh, and uh, be well, everybody. And uh, all of you who are watching, uh, we have five more events. Uh, quickly, uh, I've done this before, but maybe you missed it at the beginning. Uh, tomorrow we have at 11 a.m. Freedom with Leah Yippy, Michael Hart, and Martin Hagman and Vanessa Wills. Leah is an Albanian political scientist who teaches at a uh, political theorist who teaches at uh, uh, I think the London School of Economics, and uh, uh, she has a bestseller out, a left bestseller on growing up in Albania. Uh, or at, at least being a teenager in Albania during the last uh, years of Stalinism and the first years of the crazy uh, hyper-capitalism that took over. Um, wow, I've just lost the uh, uh, my plot here back again. What was neoliberalism comes on on uh, Friday at 3, that's tomorrow at 3, with... Uh, Sarah Briette, Nico Singh, Joshua Clover, and Jamie Merchant. On Saturday at 11, Uno Kozo's Theory of Crisis. Today, uh, uh, a fascinating Japanese market. His Theory of Crisis book has been translated by Ken Kawashima for Historical Materialism Press. Uh, there will be a discussion of that at 11, part of our Marxology section. At 3 o'clock, also in the Marxology category, There's No Such Thing as the Economy, which is the title of a book by Samuel Chambers. Uh, we'll be discussing that with Sam, uh, Cordelia Belton, Edward uh, of Real Abstractions, and Soren Mao, who also has a book called Impersonal Compulsion about Capital, which will be part of the discussion. And finally, our last panel on Monday at uh, 11 a.m., uh, in collaboration with Spectre Journal, Ukraine imperialism and the world economy. We will have an actual Ukrainian broadcasting from Ukraine. Uh, Yulia Yurchenko, who wrote the book for Pluto Press, uh, Ukraine and the political economy of capital, I think it is. Uh, it's a great book anyway. Uh, so thanks for watching. If you like what we do, go to the website. Donate, press donate, and uh, bye-bye. We'll see you hopefully next couple of days.